Okay, so it's Wednesday, it's week five. Uh, you know, remember midterm is a week from tomorrow night. Make sure it's on your schedule so you don't forget. I will give you lots of reminders. We'll talk more about the midterm early next week. There's gonna be a review session. I think it'll be early next week. I'll let you know once I have the date and time and room. Study materials are up. You can look at them whenever you see fit. Uh, okay, what I wanna talk about today, last time we talked about objects and classes. We talked about arrays. I want to transition, you know, we're still talking about implementing collections, but what I want to spend most of our unit of material on this week is talking about what's called implementing a linked list. And that has to do with another related subject called pointers. So I think if you ask people who have taken this class and you say, what's the hard part of that class? They'll say it's recursion and pointers. Those are the two big ones I think you'd hear a lot of people would, would mention as two of the hardest topics. So, because it's a challenging topic, we're going to spend a lot of time on it. We're going to spend all the rest of this week on it. We're going to spend a lot of next week on it. And um, later on, we'll actually mix the two. We'll use recursion and pointers in the same code, and we'll call it a binary tree. You'll see all about that later. Um, anyway, I guess I want to sort of give you the same disclaimer that I give when I talk about recursion, which is that I think some students take a while to get to the point where they fully understand this material. It might not be really easy and obvious to you just after today's lecture. That's okay, we're gonna go practice in section the next few days. Uh, we're gonna do lots more to practice this content as we go forward. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. So, um, the reason we're talking about this topic, the motivation here, is that there's a general strategy that you can use to implement a collection that's called a linked structure. Now, uh, we just, the other day, we saw how to implement a collection using an array. An array is just a big brick of memory that's all together, contiguous memory. <coughs> that's one way to implement a collection. It can work pretty well. There's another strategy, which is that you make a bunch of small pieces of memory that are sort of connected to each other, almost like links in a chain. And so one uh, way that that's described is you can call that a linked list. Now that structure has some benefits. I, I very briefly talked about this thing uh, back in week two, and I showed you that there's a vector class and there's a linked list class, and I showed you that they set, supported the same operations. You can add and remove and these kinds of things, right? Get and set elements. And I used that as a vehicle for talking about ADTs, abstract data types. And I said, you could implement these, two, these sets of operations in two different ways, and each way might have relative pros and cons. So some of the strengths of the vector implementation were that it's, um, it's fast for looking for random elements. You can jump to any random index pretty quickly, but it's slow for certain operations. Like if you want to insert something at the front of a vector, you have to shift everybody over. You remember all that, right? Well, if you store data in this sort of linked way, it has a different set of pros and cons. In particular, if you want to insert something at the front of the list, it's much faster. You don't need to shift anything. And I'll show you why. I'll show you some pictures of, of this concept later on. But this is a way that you might want to implement a data structure, and it might be a good way to implement that structure. So that's why we're going to learn about it. So OK, if we want to learn about this concept, about how to implement a collection this way, there's kind of an underlying concept that we need to talk about first that's kind of specific to the C++ language. And that concept is called pointers. So let me talk about that for a little while. Um, imagine if you were gonna implement this. Well, how do you represent these little boxes, these little individual pieces of memory that store pieces of data inside of them? Well, you can use uh, something called a structure for this, or a struct. A struct is like a small little class. We're just talking about classes. Classes have variables inside, and they have methods inside, they have data and behavior. A struct is basically a class, but a struct is usually just for some little thing that only has sort of one or two pieces of information inside. It doesn't usually have a lot of behavior, mostly just data. Um, like here's a really simple structure type for dates that stores a month and a day. And now that's declaring a new type. So now you can make date objects, date structures, and you can set the dot month and the dot day of them. So it's like a class, except the member variables are public rather than private, okay? So you can make date objects now. I think I created a new type. So struct is like a lightweight class. Okay, fine. Well, what if, remember, I'm trying to build something like this. So I want to make these little nodes that each store a piece of data inside, and then they also have some kind of link to another node. So how would I do that? Well, I could make a structure called list node. Maybe I want to store a list of ints. So each node stores an int of data inside. But how do I store, you know, each node has to store a way to get to another node. 
So how do I store that? Well, you might think that the type of that question mark there should be list node. You can store a list node who's the next node. But in C++, that, uh, that wouldn't make any sense, because it would be like saying a list node has a list node inside of it, which has a list node inside of it, which has a list node inside of it. It would be sort of this infinitely uh, recursively described structure, and it wouldn't make any sense. So that actually doesn't work. It's not that I have a list node inside of me, like a whole box inside of me. It's that I have some way of reaching a list node. I have a way to go to get to a list node. So in C++, that concept is called a pointer. So let me talk about that. Pointers have to do with memory and memory addresses. I think you guys probably have a little bit of a concept of memory. Like if you make variables, you make a vector, you make an int, it goes into the memory of the computer, right? I mean, we haven't talked about memory very much, but everything is stored in the memory. Well, C++ is an interesting language because for any variable that you have, you can actually ask where that variable is stored in the computer's memory. I haven't made it very clear yet why you would want to ask that, but you can. Start with that. You can. And the way that you do so is you write an ampersand in front of the name of the variable. Ampersand is called the address of operator. A memory address is an integer. Think of the computer's memory as a giant array. And you can access any location in the memory if you have the index or the address to go to get to that data. So anyway, when you declare variables, like here in this code, I declare three variables, two ints and a, a structure. Somewhere in the memory, it puts all three of those variables. Okay? And so this picture, what I'm trying to draw here is like the variable's name and its value. And then on the left, I've written some made up number that's the memory address of that variable. That's not a significant number. I made it up. If you ran a program, you could print these addresses and you could see them, but they probably wouldn't be these exact numbers. Although it might be true that there were Relative values would be, you differ by the same amount. Usually an int takes up four bytes of memory. And for me, if you declare two ints, their memory addresses would probably differ by four. Now, why do I write zero x seven? What is all this stuff? Well, that's called hexadecimal notation, or base 16. We learned a little bit about binary, or base two. Base 16 is just every digit goes from zero to 15 in value. And the, you represent the values as zero through nine, and then a through f are the values 10 through 15. So it's just, don't, don't get too freaked out about these weird looking numbers. Um, this is just a, an integer, it's just a number, but I'm just writing it in a different numeric base. The reason we write it in a different base uh, is partly because uh, base 16 is a little more compact than base 10, the numbers would be longer. And it's also because most memory, the power of two is more interesting to us than the power of 10, because most sizes of things are multiples of four or eight or 32. And so this just tends to be how people write memory addresses. Although I could have written this as, you know, a million four hundred sixty-five thousand eight hundred and sixty-two, or whatever. You know, I could have written that out as a base ten; would be fine. Um, anyway, look, you can ask for the memory address of any value in C plus plus using this ampersand, the address of operator. So if you print x, it says forty-two because that's the value that I gave mm -hmm. x. If I say print the address of x, it will print this hexadecimal number. <coughs> if I print the address of y, I see the address of y. You can print the address of a structure too. You can also print the address of the individual variables inside of the structure. And it's interesting because like the first variable of the structure has the same memory address as the structure itself. And the second variable of the structure has an address that's a few bytes ahead of that. You know, so it's kind of like you can sort of see how it like stores these things in the memory of the computer. Okay? Well, great. So what? Like what what do I do with this information? Well, let me show you something else. Here we go. You can make something that's called a pointer. A pointer is a variable that stores a memory address. That's what a pointer is. Now, usually, when you declare a pointer, you say this pointer points at a value of a certain type. So <clears throat> this blue line here is an example of creating a pointer. The way you might read this is you might say int pointer p stores the address of x. So now p is a variable. And the value stored in that variable is a number, an integer, but we think of it as a memory address number. And it is storing the memory address that x is located at. Okay. So you can, you can remember someone else's memory address in a variable. That's called a pointer. <coughs> now, what's the point of that? No pun intended, I guess. Um, you can use the pointer to access and modify the thing that it's pointing at. So 
Once you've made a pointer, P points to X, P stores the address as X. If you print out the pointer, it'll print out its memory value and it stores the address, whatever, the address that X is at. If you use the star operator, it means follow the pointer, go to the thing that it points at, and you look at what's there. So if you say, I want to print star P, that means I want to print what's pointed at by P, which means I want to print X. I want to print the value of X, so it prints 42. Okay? You can also use a pointer to modify what's stored at that address. If you say star P equals 99, what you're saying is go to the place that P is pointing to and store a 99 in that place. So now X stores 99. So P is a way of reaching X. And star P is an alias for X. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Where else have we seen this concept before? Like one variable could kind of modify or affect the value of another variable. Where have you seen that? Yeah? Passing by reference. Passing by reference, yeah. A lot of students have that kind of a question, like is pointer the same as passing by reference? Kind of. Pointers were invented first. References came later to make the syntax easier. References weren't that hard to learn because you say, oh, I add an ampersand into my parameter and then it kind of works, then it modifies main or it shares whatever. You didn't have to think too much. Pointers are basically shitty references in some way. That might be one way of thinking of it, but it's a similar idea that this variable's really main purpose is to talk about that variable or look at that variable or change its value or something like that, okay? <coughs> By the way, notice how I say star P equals 99? What do you think it would mean if I said P equals 99? What would that, if there's no star, what would that mean? Or what do you think that would be doing? Yes? The hexadecimal value of X would be 99, in which case like, the value of X would be like Yeah, um, it's more about the hexadecimal like memory address. So basically what, if I just said P equals 99, what that would mean is make P store the memory address 99. So even here, it would store 99. And what does that mean? Well, now it means P points to memory address 99, but what's that memory address 99? I don't know. Probably nothing good. So that means basically P would be pointing to some garbage place that I don't even know what's, what's located there. I mean, there's lots of analogies people use for pointers. Like, it's a little bit like storing someone's phone number in your phone, you know? It'd be like, you know, I have your phone number stored in there, and I can follow that pointer. I can call that number to reach you, to talk to me, right? But if I, in my phone, if I change the number to store 99 and I save it, that doesn't change what your phone number is in real life and it doesn't do anything to you, but it does mean that if I try to call it, I won't reach you anymore. If you set the pointer to store 99 and then you try to follow it, it will no longer lead you to edit X. It will lead you to some other place, right? So that's kind of the meaning of that if we were to say that without the start, which is not a meaningful thing to do. We wouldn't want to do that. Yeah? Will C++ or like your creator let us uh, like set the pointer to something? number that's like turns out it's a very important part of the computer and then change it? That's a good question. What if I set the pointer to some important place like the, the operating system core and I jump to that pointer and I break the operating system or something? Uh, basically the worst that can happen is you'll crash your program or you'll corrupt your own program's data temporarily while it's running. You can't break the operating system with this because of a system that you'll probably learn about in 107 or, or later that's called virtual memory, where every program has a separate space of addresses that it can use. And it's not possible for one program to mess up the contents of another program that's running. Uh, it, you don't have to worry about that, but it might crash the program is the worst part that could happen, okay? So anyway, you can have pointers, you can follow pointers. Pointers get you back to the value of some other variable. Um, I, I, you know, you have to bear with me for a few minutes because you might say, well, I thought we were trying to build a linked list. What does this have to do with building a linked list? Well, you know, I'm teaching you to wax in the car, but I'm actually teaching you Kung Fu, right? So uh, we're getting there. Give me a minute. Well, okay, so here's a couple of other variations of uh, pointers. You can have something called a null pointer. You've probably heard of null from Java, JavaScript, Python. You've seen null before, right? Null sort of means nothing, no object, empty, that kind of thing, right? In C++, we have null, but null has a very specific meaning in C++. Null is a pointer that points to the memory address zero. It's the, it's the value zero as a memory address. And basically nothing is stored at memory address zero. So if you initialize a pointer, you could set the pointer to store zero. You could do that. It's considered better style to write null pointer instead of zero. But that basically means don't point at anything. 
If you try to print out that pointer, you can do that. You can print out a pointer if it's null. The line that says C out P1, it'll print zero. That's fine, you can print zero. But if you try to follow the pointer, if you try to print star P1, what that means is go to memory address zero, grab what's there, and print it. That won't, that, that won't work. That will crash your program. It's called a segmentation fault or seg fault. A program will crash, okay? That doesn't work. I have another thing on the same slide here where I say int star p2, and I don't even give it a value. I just put semicolon. And what you'll start to see in C++ is if you don't initialize things, it's not going to end well for you. You need to give things values. If you don't give p2 a value, it just stores random garbage. It points to somewhere. I don't know where. If you try to follow p2, it'll very likely crash your program. <laughs> The weirdest thing is it might not crash your program because it might just jump somewhere that has valid data and it might give you that data, but it won't be anything useful or anything that you expect. So you probably don't want to do this. Anyway, null pointers and garbage pointers are important to know about. It's not always a bug if you have a null pointer. You might want a null pointer because you don't have anything that you want to point at at that point in time in your program. But you, know, you have to understand what a null pointer is and what it means. Um, you can. Yep. I think some students get overly concerned, like if it's null, I don't want to touch it or look at it or use it because it'll crash my program. And sure, I mean, you should be careful about null pointers, but I want you to understand that you can ask whether a pointer is null. That won't crash anything. This if statement will be true if the pointer is null, and it'll be false if the pointer isn't null. You can ask that. That doesn't crash anything. There's a shorter version of the same test. You can just say if p1. If you want to save a couple of characters, you can just say if p1. That means if p1 isn't null. Uh, if not P1 means if P1 is null. Anyway, well, so those are null and garbage pointers. Yeah, question, go ahead. Um, is there a better way to find what the variable name is for what's starting Oh, that's an interesting question. Like if, um, if I'm back here and P points to X, mm -hmm. can I somehow find out the name X that P points at X with that name? Unfortunately, no. C++ doesn't store that. It just stores the memory address. My analogy would be like if I had a set of GPS coordinates, and it turns out that there's a Taco Bell there, but just having those coordinates, I might not know that, I, that, I'm, that that's Taco Bell. I just know that if I go there, I can go to that place and I can see what's there, and, but I don't know what it is in terms of its, its name or something. Now you're hungry, aren't you? You want to go eat some Taco Bell and get really bad indigestion. Uh, don't do that. Um, OK. so. We're, we're starting to get close to linked list. We're almost there. OK. <clears throat> you can have a pointer that points at a, at a structure or an object. Doesn't this look more like Java or other languages? Date d1 equals new date. Yeah, that looks kind of like Java. Oh, I feel, I feel happy now. It reminds me of 106a when May run threw me candy, and I had Carol the robot, and colors, and things were so nice back then. Yes, this does look like Java syntax. Um, you can use a pointer to create and store an object or a structure. Now, this syntax doesn't match the syntax I was just using a few slides ago. So I want to talk about this for a minute. Um, I actually deleted my slide on this because I just wanted to talk to you about it on the, on the notepad here. There's two ways to declare an object. One is sort of what I would call the non-pointer way, where you'd say like date d1, and then you could say d1.month equals 7, d1.day equals 13 or whatever. The second way of declaring an object is where you declare it as a pointer. And that looks like this. Date pointer d2 equals a new date. d2 arrow month equals 7. d2 arrow day equals 13. What's the difference? Why do we have both of these? Which one is better? What's going on here? The first syntax is simpler, and sometimes we would use that first syntax. It has a problem, which has to do with scope. Um, if you declare any value of any kind, and it's inside of a function, void foo, if you declare a variable, eventually you get to the end of the foo function. When you get to the end of any scope, in particular a function scope, it cleans up and throws out any values that you created during that function. So at this point, right as we hit this closing bracket, d1 is thrown away. It's thrown out of the computer's memory. It's cleaned up. And you know this because like, you create variables and then you exit the function and you can't refer to that variable anymore. Like, you know this concept in a different way. Variables are thrown out when you reach the end of their scope. Okay, 
So I have this second syntax at the bottom of the slide where I created the object as a pointer. If you do that inside of a function, so I have void foo2 like this, if you get to the end of this function, d2 is not thrown away. And we're going to talk a lot more about this over the next several lectures, but this is a really important feature that we want to take advantage of. We're going to build something called a linked list where we make little objects and we connect them together, building a chain of them connected by pointers. <coughs> by pointers. And the problem is we don't want those objects to be automatically cleaned up or thrown away by anyone. We want our code to manage the memory and the allocation and the scope and the lifespan of these little objects. And for that reason, we must use this second syntax that I've written on the slide here. And I'm going to teach you more about exactly what the heck is going on as we advance in our, in our lectures in the course. But the short answer is just that this second style indicates to the compiler, indicates to the language that you want this object to live longer. You want to manage its memory yourself. And that's important to what we need to do here. Yes, Oh, that's a good question. Is a pointer like a global variable? I wouldn't say that. I mean, it's not, it's not that the scope of this variable D2 is, is somehow global now. It's more that the memory that the data is storing and all the values that it's storing will be left as they are for as long as I, as I say. And if you're thinking about variable names and variable scope, we can talk about that in a minute. But it's really more about the memory. If I build all these little objects and I connect them all together, I want that to just stay just so. And if I make some of those little objects over here in this function and some of those little objects over there in that function, I don't want those functions going and cleaning up portions of my linked list for me. I want the linked list to stay put. And then when I'm done with my linked list, I'll clean up the memory and stuff. So it's, it's a detachment from a system that we've relied on for most of our code in this course so far. I think there's kind of a natural question if you think about this for a second and you go, wait a minute. I never used this syntax before with vectors and hash maps and all these other things. Why? If this, if this is so important for, for building a structure, then why didn't I have to think about it before? The answer is that inside of those structures, those structures, the internal code is doing this stuff for you. You don't have to learn about it because the libraries are doing it. So you're utilizing this concept without having to learn about it. That's one of the reasons we have these libraries. You cannot think about this until this point in the course. Uh, I have a question about that. Yeah. And yeah, this variable D2, is an, its name won't be understood outside the function, but the memory that I build and the contents I put in it will be. I, I'll show you, I mean, the bigger picture of like many functions talking to these objects, I'll talk about kind of how we'll achieve that in a second, but I just want to start with this as this pair of syntaxes, and I want to say that when we're doing this linked list stuff, we're going to use this, this second style here, basically. Uh, another question, yeah. Um, is there a way to access the, the variables inside D2 without well, okay, yeah, this arrow. What is this arrow? The arrow basically means, so imagine if it were the above, the up above syntax. We would have said d2.month, right? But that doesn't quite work because that works if your variable is a date. This is not a date, it's a date pointer. So what we really want is we want to go to the thing that d2 points at, go to the date that d2 is pointing at, and then go to the dot month of that. So the arrow is a shorthand for follow the pointer and then dot something. That's what the arrow means. And so maybe that first, when I was learning C++, I actually always wrote it this first way that I've got highlighted here because that made more sense to me. But I think now that I'm more comfortable with the language, I'm like, yeah, 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 I don't want to write all those parentheses. Just do it the way the language is telling me to do it, basically. But it means the same thing. Follow the pointer, then look at the day, day and variable inside of what's stored there. So that's what this syntax is doing. I recognize it's a little weird. It's a little weird. These are, I have to admit to you, this is a particular part of the course where I'm not a big C++ fan. Some of these concepts would be easier for me to teach you and easier for you to learn in another language. Like anything, like Java, like Python, like JavaScript. All of these things would have less muck in another language. But hey, here we are, so whatever. Um, I'll curve the class, don't worry. <laughs> it'll be okay. Yeah, it'll be okay. <laughs> Oh, hey, by the way, you know how I reward you guys with puppy pictures? 
I also like to reward people around exam time by dropping little hints of things that will or won't be on the test. So in a future lecture before the midterm, I will give you at least one tip of something that I think you should focus on in your study. So I want to reward you if you show up. That tip will not be on the video. If you're here at the start of lecture, you'll get that tip. So anyway, uh, <laughs> back to our program. <laughs> the tip will not be animal related or puppy related. <laughs> um, OK, anyway, look. I. I apologize. I know this is a little weird, but we got to do it. We got to work with this syntax. So that's the style of declaring a structure, storing it as a pointer, and then referring to its data. All of this is building to where we are going to have these linked lists in a minute. Bless you. Uh, one thing that's on this slide that I didn't cover yet is you can make two pointers. Look at what I the blue, the blue line here where I say D2 equals D. That means that I want D2 to point to the same place that D points. So D2 in my little picture, they both store the same memory address, whatever that address is. And if I say D2.month equals 9, it actually modifies the same object as D. I bet you saw this concept in 106A or somewhere. They probably talked about like reference variables, reference, semantic references. It's kind of the same concept. Two names, two aliases that refer to the same place, the same object. Except now we're just getting a little more nitty gritty about it. We're saying, well, it's two pointers that point to the same memory location. That's just different words for the same concept. E2 and E are referring to the same object. If you follow one pointer versus if you follow the other, you get to the same person. You wrote down the same phone number in your phone that I wrote down in my phone. If we both call the number, we get the same person on the other end of the line. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Do you mean D1? Or... Oh, did I say D? It should be, I'm so sorry. That should say D1. I'm sorry. There's no D. Uh, where is that? My bad. D1. Yeah. There's no D. It, I, it said D first, and I changed it to D1 because I just thought it would be easier to read, but I missed a, a, an occurrence. So, yeah. Yes? So, why is it that you can make it so that they're equal before you start changing these So, at what point, so like once you set them so that they're equal, everything you do for the one will always be done for the other? Yeah, I mean, the literal meaning of that blue line is I want D2 to store the same memory address in it that D1 stores. So if you look at this picture, whatever D1 is storing, whatever memory address, I said D2 equals that. D2 should store that. And now, whenever you say D1 arrow or D2 arrow, that means go to this place, go to that memory, and then look at the month, look at the day. So at that moment, yeah, they both are going to the same memory. After that, if I said D2 equals something else, D2 could store some other memory address and point to some other place. They're not linked forever. They're just linked because I said them equal each point to the same place. Yeah. Yes, that's the point. Of, that's what I'm trying to say. When I say D2 month equals 9, it makes the one and only object that they both are pointing at store 9 as its month. So then when I print, after changing D2 month, if I print D1 month, I will see the 9 there as well. That's the, I'm trying to draw that here, yeah, yes. <coughs> okay, <laughs> we're, we're getting there. So, ta-da, what a linked list node stores is a one piece of data, like if I'm making a list of ints, it will store an int of data, and the other thing that a node stores is a pointer, the memory address of the next node in the chain. So if you're a little fuzzy on this, I mean, look, you can't say list node next because that would be like a box here having another box inside of which would have another box inside. That would be infinitely uh, sized. That wouldn't make sense. But, but what I can do is I can store a memory address, and if I go to that memory address, there will be another node there. That's what a linked list node stores. So let me show you, like, if you just had this, if that's all you had, what could you do with this? Well. You could represent a linked list roughly as the following. You could say, make a new node. I've got a bunch of crazy colors here that I'm just trying to map from the code to the picture here, the outlines of the nodes. I could say, make a node called front and set it to store a new list node. So it makes a new node in the computer's memory. So front points to that node. Front is a variable, a pointer, that points to an object that's a node. Now I say, hey, go to follow the front and inside the data, store 42. So that puts this here. Then I say, make front next point to a new node, and make that next node's data store negative 3. 
and make the next node's next store another new node, and make that next next node's data store a 17, and, and so on. Do you see how this silly piece of code makes these node objects and glues them together with these next pointers? And also note that the very last line, the very last node, will set his next to be null, indicating there isn't any node after me. There's no node after me. I'm the last node in the list. Now, I would fully acknowledge that just looking at this for the first time, you're probably reacting by saying, can you please just use an array? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Seriously, right? I get it. I get it. But <laughs> once you get used to this, what you'll find is, hey, if I choose to build a list in this way, I can actually pretty quickly insert data in the front or in the middle. All you've got to do is rewire some of these pointers, and now the list has new stuff in it. And that's powerful. That's why we're learning about this. It's an important general concept to learn about. <laughs> OK, so if we have these kinds of things, uh, let's, let's talk about when you have pointers and you make assignment statements. What do those statements do? What do they mean? This is important to practice and learn. If I say A next equals B next, that the meaning of that line of code is I want to go to the A next variable pointer thing, and I want to set it equal to, which means I want to make it point at the same place that the next variable points at. So let me explain. What's A next? That's this turquoise box right here. Okay? Make that box point to the same place that B next points at. So in other words, Do that. Now, what a lot of students do here is they think if you say a next equals b next, then what you ought to do is make this guy point at here. That's probably what some people would expect this to do. But that's not what it does. I mean, it says make a next point to the same place that e next point. Or if you're really mechanical about it, think instead of arrows, think of it as this is storing some number, some address in memory. And this is storing an address in memory. And what I'm saying is, make this one store the same address that this one has. The address that this one has means it here. So now I want this one to store that same address, so it will also be left here. So that's kind of the meaning of this in terms of the mechanics of the pointers of the memory address. That's what it's doing. And you need to be able to understand what these kind of statements mean, because you will have pictures, like you'll have a before picture and an after picture. And you'll say, how do I turn this into that? Or you'll have some code that you've written, and you'll say, why doesn't it work? <laughs> and you'll need to trace through what your statements that you wrote do. So you have to have this, uh, this concept. So OK, what if, what if instead I had just said, uh, uh, I'm going to delete this red arrow just so I can play. What if it had just been A equals B next? What do you think that would do? <coughs> can you tell me in the picture, like, what, what do I change about the, the drawing here? Somebody want to help me? <coughs> So right, A will no longer point to this 10 node. Instead, A will point to this 40 node. So then if I said A arrow data, it would say 40. And if I said A arrow next, it would say null. What happens to the 10 and the 20 node? Well, if you look at the picture, there isn't anybody pointing to those nodes anymore. So actually, there's no way to talk to those nodes. There's no way to look at them. I've lost them. Their data is gone. I can't reach them. Just like any piece of data, if you don't store it in a variable, you don't have it anymore. Same idea. It's not that different from that concept. What if I had said A equals B? What does that do? Again, I want you to think of the, the way I want you to speak these assignment statements aloud is make A point where B points. B points to here, so make A point to here, like that. Don't point there, point down there. Again, it doesn't go like that. A doesn't point at B. A points to the thing that B points to. I guess another way of saying it is you don't point to a pointer. You point to an object. I want to think of it that way. What if I said A next next equals B? What does that do? 
Somebody want to help me? Yes, you with the glasses, yeah. Yeah, after the 20, I would go there. So in effect, if I start from A and I walk forward, I'll see 10, 20, 30, 40 now. So conceptually, A is a linked list with four elements. You might think, wait, but it's weird that B points into the middle of the list and A points to the start. I mean, that's OK. There's something illegal about that. It's just you could enter the subway in different stations or something. You know, whatever. It's different entry points to the same list. Uh, one thing, though, is you can't go backwards. Like, if you're, if you're starting at B, there's no way to follow B to get to the 10 node or the 20 node. You can only follow the pointers one direction. Uh, yes? Oh, like because I have four pointers to the four nodes, but I'm only using two, I'm only using A and D or something like that? Yeah, so like, um, like you did like 10 million pointers, you only use five million. And the other five million are occupied in the space that you'll never use. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'd say you don't have to worry about that, because usually what you do is you make a front pointer like A, and you store, you make him point to a node, and then you make his node's next point to the next node. And you don't have a separate variable for that. The only like variable you really have is like the front, like A. And then all the other nodes are reached by saying next, 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 next. And that's how you get to the other nodes. And so you don't have all these external variables pointing to each individual <coughs> node. You just have a one that points to the front node. And you follow the next to get to the other, basically. So I think what you're concerned about is that I have a bunch of external pointers pointing into various places. And those pointers are not useful. We just basically don't make those pointers. That's not, we don't need them. OK, well, let me uh, look. I had a, a piece of code back here. I want to copy this piece of code into Qt Creator because I want to talk about it for a second. So uh, here. OK, so I've got a linked list that stores some values. Now, remember, if, we're, if the goal here is to implement a collection, collections have like operations that you can do to them. Remember we made a stack the other day, and we made a push, and we made a pop. And so if we're making a collection out of this crap, we should have like methods or something. We should have things you can do to the collection. We should have ways to do that behavior. Like there should be an add method and remove. There should be stuff like that, right? So that's where we're trying to get to. But I want to start with something simpler. I want to start with like what if I want to print the elements of a linked list? So imagine I would say void print, and so it you know prints the given linked list. Well, what parameter would you pass? You know, if I want to print this thing, I'd say print what? Do you know what I mean? Like, what would you think would go here? I want to sort of give the data to this function. So how do I give it all the data? I mean, there's four little nodes, new list node, new list node. It seems like I need to pass all of them in as parameters, right? But so does that mean the function should take four parameters? Like, what do you think I should do? Yeah. So pass in the front. Exactly. So, so say front. And then up here you say something like list node star front or, or whatever you want to call it. I'll call it node. Maybe I'll give it a different name on purpose just so it's clear that it's a separate variable. But yeah, if you pass in the front, the front can get you to all of the other nodes. You understand? So if you wanted to print the data that's stored in the first node, would you say see out node? Indle, is that the way to say that? If I want to see the, the number that's stored there, how would I say that? Yeah? You say node data? Because the little objects have a data variable inside and they have a next variable inside, right? So if I print the node, what would it have done if I had just print node, by the way? What would that do? What do you think would come out on the console? I know what you're thinking. You're like, why couldn't you have done this lecture before the drop date <laughs> so I could have known it was going to get like this? Uh, no, no, but let's not think about that. Um, I save all the nasty stuff till just after the drop date. That's how we roll in computer science. Uh, what would it have done if I had printed a note? Like, what do you think? This it would have printed some kind of memory address, 0x7fb3 something, whatever, whatever memory address that that node is living at. I don't really care about that. That's not interesting. I want to know the int 
that's in there, right? So that's just what uh, you said, which was print the uh, data of the node. Okay, so that would print the first element of the list, right? Well, I also need to print the second element of the list, right? So that's stored as node next data. That's the second element, right? And the third element is node next next data, right? And then the fourth one is next 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 data. This is a little silly, isn't it? Um, okay. Well, what if I just ran that real quick? What would that do? 42, negative 3. I mean, I think it is printing the values that I put into. So I printed a linked list, right? Hooray. But this code is not very general, right? I want to be able to print a list of any length. If I pass in only three nodes, I want it to still work. If I pass in five nodes, I want it to still work. Well, one way we could get around that would be we could add a second parameter. We could pass in the length of the list or something like that. But I don't think that's quite right either. So let's come back to this print method for a second. How do I print the whole linked list here? Normally when we want to do things repeatedly, we do a loop, right? So that the general model here for how to process the elements of a linked list is you say see out front data and then you say front equals front next. So in other words, what you're doing is move to the next node. Make my front pointer now point to the next node. And if you keep doing this, you'll sort of print and move ahead, print and move ahead, print and move ahead. Go to the next node, go to the next node, go to the next node, print, print, print. How long should I do this? We would wrap this in some kind of loop, a for loop, a while loop. Now we happen to know that we have four nodes, so I could write a for loop that goes up to four, but I don't want to take advantage of that. I'd rather loop just as long as there's more data to print. So. What's the stop condition? When should I stop doing this? What do you think, sir? While front isn't a null pointer. Once front becomes a null pointer, eventually we go next, 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 and then we get to that null, and then that means there aren't any more nodes, so we should stop. Let's do it. Let's run it. Let's see what happens. It prints all the nodes. Great. So wait, but that's the same output I had before. Let me make sure that it works. Let me make... Uh, this be another new list node that stores 888. And let's make, uh, or wait, 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 new list node. And then I have to say his data is 888 and his next equals null pointer. I, I just added one more node to the list. I just want to make sure if it prints all five of the nodes now, it does. Okay, good. You know, I bet you might want to be able to print a linked list more than once. So let's do this. See out, here is the list, handle, and then let's do it again. Let's do, uh, here is the list again. Let's see what that does. Hey, wait. How come it didn't print anything? How come it, didn't, it didn't do it the second time. Why didn't that work? Does anybody know what's going on here? Yeah, um, it's, it's already reached the end of the list, and so when I try to print it again, it's already over at the null. Yeah, if that's not obvious, I, I think there's probably plenty of people who are, who are tr still trying to figure that out or see that. Let me show a picture that might help. So, uh, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Um, we're doing this, basically, right? While the list, or I think ours is called front, but while the front's not null, print the data and then go to the next, right? Seems good. But watch what happens to the picture. The list is pointing to the front of my data. And I say, print the data. It prints the 10. Then I say, go to next. OK, I'll go to the next. Print the data, 20. Go to the next. And do you see that like we no longer have anybody pointing to the 10 and the 20? We've lost our, our starting point to the data? The front was the only way we had of reaching all those nodes, and we changed its value. Oops. Does it make sense what's happened here? What, why we've lost the data? Do you have any ideas? Like, how could we not lose the data? What do you say? Store front's initial value. Save a backup of the front? Yeah, that's a great idea. I, what I would do is I would say, uh, not, I'm not going to do this to front. I would say something like list node temp equals front. So make temp point to the same place as front. Make it point to the first node. And now, while temp is not null, print temp data, move temp to the next, etc. 
And now if I wanted that same um, printing again, I could just do this again. I could print the list again. Now I can print the list twice. Now, if you want to see a picture of that, here's a picture. I think on my slide I call it uh, current, but that's the same thing as temp, what I said a second ago. So now current is a new pointer that points to the same place that list points or that front points. So it looks like that. And now if I say current equals current next, it moves that bottom arrow, but it doesn't mess up the top arrow. So that's an important concept. If you want to traverse a list, if you want to walk across a linked list, you need to do it in a way that doesn't explode the data that you're trying to uh, look at. So if you were to make a method, um, would it also, would you still have to make a temp variable? Or That's a good question. If it was a method, you technically don't need a temp variable because the parameter itself is a copy of the pointer. It's a temp variable of its own. So actually, let me go back to that method approach for a second. So if I grab this and I go up here and I, I say, hey, let's go back to that print method it would look a little bit like that, except I think I would say node instead of uh, front. So that same code would work, but I think you're right that I don't need the same temporary variable here for that reason. But now, down here, I could just say print front, and I could say print front again, and it would print the list twice. So I get two copies of the list out on the screen. There's my print function that starts at the front and walks to the end. Okay. Uh, question in the back, yes. Uh, if 10 and front, front point to the same spot, why doesn't changing one of them change the other one? That's a good question. Um, there's a big difference between temp equals and temp data equals. If I said temp equals something, that means point to somewhere else. It doesn't ma matter what you point. If I'm a copy of you, and we both point to some place, and I decide I want to point at some other place, that doesn't change you. That doesn't change what you point to. But if I say, go to the place that we both point at and change the data that is found there, that is an operation that will affect you and it will affect me. So the former, the first, is what I'm doing, and it's not damaging. The latter would be. If I said temp data equals 999, then I think that would mess up the, the elements of the original link list. There's one last thing I want to tell you. Um, what if you wanted to insert something at the front of a linked list? So add at front. We've got this chain of you know, 42 and all these different things. I want to insert a new value at the very front of the list. How would I do that? So I've got this front variable. Let's say I want to add the value, you know, 8888 at the front of the list. I can make a new node, list node, new node equals a new list node. I could put data equals 8888, okay. That node, I hope you would understand, that node is not connected to the other nodes yet. They're not part of the chain yet, right? If I want them to be at the front of the list, who should their next be? Uh, new node next. Who should their next be? What do you think? It should point to the current front of the list, right? So I come before what's right now thought of as the front. I'm before them. Okay. Are we done? Well, if we are, then when I print the list, shouldn't it have 8888 in front of it, right? Let's see. Wait, 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 wait. I think I had an 888. Okay, bad choice. Uh, let's put seven, let's put this. That's the new value, okay? Sorry, I think I, I put an 88 up there some other reason, but. Here's the list again. It doesn't have that 7777 in it anywhere, right? So what's going on? What do I still need to do here? Do you have a, a suggestion? I thought your hand came up. Maybe somebody I haven't called yet. Any ideas what's missing? made a new node, I put them before the front because what's after them is the front. That seems pretty good, right? I mean, my picture basically looks like I make the new node, I make this next of them point here. What's the problem? What do you say? Yeah. 
So I could st I need to start printing from here. I mean, the short answer would be make this pointer point here instead of pointing at the 10. Make it point to this new front node that I have added. So I think the way I would prefer to say that is front equals new node. Make the front point to this guy instead of to the old front. He's This new guy is the new front of the linked list. So when I run it and print the list now, it prints the um, 7777 as the first value that comes out. Okay, that's all the time I have. I know this is a confusing topic. We will do lots more with linked lists on Friday. I will see you guys then. Have a good day.